Uh, you're very welcome to tonight's lecture um, and we're very honoured tonight to have as our speaker uh, Ronan McGreevy. Uh, Ronan McGreevy works for the Irish Times, a uh, regular contributor to the Irishman's Diary page uh, and he's the author of a number of books uh, including uh, Wherever the Firing Line Extends, uh, Ireland and the Western Front and Centenary Ireland uh, remembering, Remembers 1916, the official book recalling the 2016 commemorations. Uh, he's also the author of the recently published uh, much acclaimed book which will be the subject of his talk tonight Great Hatred, the Assassination of Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson MP uh, which took place in 1922 and this lecture tonight is part of the uh, uh, Decade of Centenaries Commemorations uh, programme. Uh, Ronan has also conducted battlefield tours of the Western Front uh, of the First World War and just as mentioning him that this hotel, the Greville Arms Hotel, uh, the subject of tonight's talk, Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, was actually in this hotel on at least one occasion in 1908 after a fire at the barracks uh, destroyed the officers' mess, they relocated the mess to this hotel and Sir Henry came down from the Curra to make sure that everything was in proper order uh, for, for the officers who were now dining here. So uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Ronan tonight as our speaker and to thank Sarah Jane Foster who is recording tonight's lecture. Thank you very much. Ronan. Uh, good evening everybody and um, uh, thank you very much for your kind words Ruth and I'd like to thank Seamus O'Brien and all the um, members of the committee here for having me tonight. Um, I should start off by asking can you hear me down the back? Yes. Okay. It's one of those um, historical conundrums I often wonder how people were heard in the days before amplification. Uh, it's just something I am, um, <laughs> a sort of, it's a complete digression, but it's a bit of an obsession that I have. Um, we often hear about the monster rallies that O'Connell had at Tara Hill, etc. But did anybody actually hear him? Um, I, I don't know, but I, I digress. But if anybody had an answer to that, please tell, let me know, because it's something I've been thinking about for an awful long time for no particular reason. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, on June the 22nd, 1922, Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson was shot dead on the doorstep of his own home by two disabled Great War veterans turned Irish nationalists Reggie Dunn and Joseph O'Sullivan. There they are. O'Sullivan had lost a leg at Passchendaele. Dunn's right knee was shattered during the German Spring Offensive of March 1918. The two were quickly apprehended, but only after shooting and seriously injuring two policemen. They were put on trial for murder, sentenced to death, and then hanged on the 10th of August 1922. The assassination of Henry Wilson was not only a huge moment in British and Irish history, but also made worldwide news. He was one of the men who had won the war as far as most of his contemporaries were concerned. He was part of the Allied uh, Joint Command that uh, brought Germany to defeat in 100 days. I'm just going to show you um, two slides to give you some indication of the international import of, of his death. This is Le Petit Journal, it's the front page, and it's also the, 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 the image that um, was used to, to, to advertise this talk. And here's the New York Times, the front page, if you all see it, he's the lead story, as he was in um, all the major American newspapers and all the major English-speaking newspapers across the world. So, 
those are the ball facts of the Wilson shooting, but its impact on the course of Irish history, which makes it most interesting. The Wilson shooting was Ireland's Sarajevo moment. As students of history will recall, the shooting of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand at Sarajevo on the 28th of June 1914, coincidentally also the anniversary of the start of the Irish Civil War, led to an ultimatum from Serbia to Austria. Germany gave Austria a blank cheque. The Russian Empire decided to back up Ser Serbia and so the interlocking series of alliances built up before the war brought Europe to catastrophe within 37 days. There's been thousands of books about the origins of the First World War, but no book can leave out the shooting of Archduke Ferdinand. The shooting was not the cause of the First World War, but it was the catalyst. So without Sarajevo, there's no First World War and the entire history of the world would be different. Could there have been another First World War? Yes, but not certainly. The world had close encounters before, most notably during the Agadir crisis of 1911, but the potential competence drew, drew back. So the Wilson shooting bears the same relationship to Ireland as the Sarajevo shooting does to the world. Without it, there would have been no British ultimatum to the provisional government led by Michael Collins, no shelling of the four courts, no civil war. Michael Collins would have lived and the history of the new Irish state would have been different. The impact of the Wilson shooting has been underestimated because of the assumption that the civil war would have happened in any way and his death only hastened the inevitable. But as IRA commander Flory O'Donoghue remembered, despite six months of the talk of the possibility of civil war, no one had allowed himself to believe it to be inevitable and no plan existed on either side for conducting it. You would think, would you not, that if civil war was inevitable, that there would have been plans drawn up and we would have known about them by now. But there was none, not even on the anti-treaty side, which had uh, uh, nominally at least more members uh, than the pro-treaty IRA. So uh, I think that's important to bear in mind. But what happened with the Wilson shooting that it laid bare the frustrations of the British government with its provincial, provisional Irish counterpart. The former viewed with ex exasperation the tolerance afforded to the anti-treaty rebels who had occupied the four courts unmolested since April the 13th. The British government also bridled at the electoral pact between Collins and de Valera in May 1922, which was a bid to stave off civil war and not make the election of June the 16th, 1922, a referendum on the anglo irish Irish Treaty, but that is exactly what it turned out to be. On the evening of June the 22nd, 1922, Lloyd George now sees his chance. He told Michael Collins that documents had been found on one of the men, done as it turned out, linking him with the anti-treaty IRA. The documents turned out to be a copy of Anthogluck, the volunteer, the Irish IRA newspaper that could be bought at newsstands in Ireland. Whether Lloyd George truly believed it or not, he now had a pretext to act he wrote to Collins. The ambiguous position of the Irish Republican Army can no longer be ignored by the British Army. Still less can Rory O'Connor be permitted to remain with his followers in open rebellion in the heart of Dublin in possession of the courts of justice organising and send out from, sending out from this centre enterprises of murder not only in the area of your government but also in the six counties and in Great Britain. So you can see here that Lloyd George conveniently or not is actually blaming the anti-treaty side for the uh, assassination of Henry Wilson. And bear in mind that the British still retained a garrison of 6,000 soldiers in Ireland. An hour after receiving the news, Neville Macready, the officer commanding in Ireland, was summoned to London. There he found the British cabinet in a state of suppressed agitation and spoiling for revenge. Churchill was charged with a feverish impetuosity. Macready would write many years later in his memoirs that he thanked Providence that he had stopped the British government acting on its threat as it would have meant a resumption of the war between Britain and Ireland which would have ended in the same unsatisfactory stalemate as the previous war. In haste he proposed to send Royal Navy ships to Dublin with reinforcements and weaponry for the British garrison. The treaty would be declared invalid. Wiser counsel prevailed and the proposed British attack was postponed. Nevertheless, 
In the House of Commons four days after the shooting, Churchill said in public what he had told the Irish in private. They would act against the anti-treaty rebels if the provisional government did not. The time has come when it is not unfair, not premature and not impatient for us to make to this strengthened Irish government and new Irish parliament a request in express terms that this sort of thing must come to an end. Fortunately for the provisional government, the anti-treaty side played into their hands. In revenge for the arrest of Leo Henderson, an anti-treaty officer who had organised a raid on Ferguson's garage in Baggett Street, the anti-treaty side captured Lieutenant General J.J. Ginger O'Connell on June the 26th. Ostensibly, this was the reason for the shelling of the four courts, prompting an ultimatum from the provisional government. Outrages such as these against the nation and the government must cease at once and cease forever. For some months, past, all classes of business in Ireland have suffered severely through the feeling of insecurity engendered by reckless and wicked acts which have tarnished the reputation of Ireland abroad. This included murder, uh, armed fights between pro and anti-treaty sides and a lot of bank robberies which were carried out by the anti-treaty side um, who believe it or not gave IOUs to the banks in question stating that this was the state's money but they were the state. Commandant General uh, Tony Lawler, who had served with the Royal Flying Corps in the war, knew how to operate the 18-pounder guns borrowed from the British. At a minute past midnight on the 27th of June, the two artillery pieces were handed over to the National Army and taken from Marlborough, which is now McKee Barracks. The guns were placed either side of the two bridges that flanked the four courts on the opposite side of the River Liffey. An ultimatum was issued to the anti-treaty rebels and the shells began. shelling began at 3.50 a.m. There are therefore three reasons I believe the civil war broke out, how it did and when it did. The principal reason was the Wilson shooting and the British ultimatum which concentrated the mind of the provisional government. The second, as I mentioned before, was the kidnapping of Lieutenant General J.J. O'Connell, the immediate cause of Spelli. The third reason, I believe, was the emergent mandate given to pro or treaty neutral forces in the general election, which was only held on June the 16th. More crucially, anti-treaty candidates only got 22% of the vote. The pro-treaty side uh, got 36.5% of the vote, and the rest went to the Labour Party, the Farmers Party and Independents, who were all uh, supportive of the treaty or neutral on the, the issue of the treaty. The provisional government had no mandate before that election. After the election, they could argue that they had one. Certainly, the defeat of anti-treaty candidates strengthened the hands of those in the cabinet who wanted a reckoning with the anti-treaty rebels, including Griffith and O'Higgins. But there would not have been unity within the cabinet but for the British ultimatum. For that reason, it seems to me that the Wilson shooting has not got the attention it deserved. There was a book entitled Ireland's Tragedy in 1961 by Rex Taylor. It wasn't a particularly good effort and of course he didn't have access to the documents I, uh, I have access to. Taylor's hypothesis was based on a letter he claimed that Reggie Dunn had written in prison in which he said that he and O'Sullivan had gone to 36 uh, Eaton Place to barrack Wilson and not to shoot him and that O'Sullivan had got an itchy trigger finger. The letter which Taylor claimed he saw it was never produced despite being asked on many occasions to do so. The late historian Peter Hart wrote the thoroughly researched uh, uh, journal article about the killing in 1982 in which he concluded that Donna Sullivan had acted of their own volition. In his otherwise exhaustively researched biography of Wilson published in 2006, Keith Jeffrey showed little, remarkably little curiosity about the circumstances of Wilson's death and was co content to accept high, high Hart's hypothesis that the men had acted, uh, acted alone. That was until my book, which has just been published. The critical question of who, who ordered the shooting is the most important issue that I have sought to address. Let me put my hypothesis about the importance of this shooting another way. What if Wilson had not been shot? Does the Irish Civil War still break out on June the 28th? I doubt it. The peculiar character of the Irish Civil War was with the use of British government, with the use of British governments is a direct result of the Wilson shooting. Would there have been another civil war? 
you say that you, you hear many commentators saying civil war was inevitable. But was it? This would imply that pro and anti-treaty forces had a plan to defeat the other, but no such plan existed on either side, as I explained before. The anti-treaty forces, which split during a tempestuous convention on June the 18th, just four days before Wilson was shot, wanted to take on the British left in Ireland, not the provisional government. And the feeble fight put up by the anti-treaty side during the Civil War is evidence of a lack of preparation, though they had on paper numerically superiority over the National Army. The Free Staters were taking advantage of the fact that we didn't want to open fire them. We were like rats in a trap, Ernie O'Malley recalled in his posthumously published memoir, The Singing Flame. Perhaps there would have been uh, an armed confrontation between pro and anti-treaty forces, but when would that have happened? It's clear that the irreconcilable differences between the ex pro and anti-treaty side were exasperated by the terms of the Free State Constitution, which retained the oath of allegiance to the monarch. But we should caution against the idea uh, that main confrontation was inevitable, it wasn't. Now I'm going to go off a little bit from my speech just to, just to talk about the motivations. Um, I, I, I talk in the book about um, that I believe that somebody gave the order for the Wilson shooting and I have um, I have narrowed it down to three possibilities. The first one is the IRA um, you often hear tell that Reggie Dunn and Joe Sullivan were members of the IRA. This is true, but it's important to state that this, this was not an IRA operation. Richard Mulcahy, who was the Chief of Staff of the IRA, knew nothing about it, and neither did anybody else in the IRA. The second reason, second possibility, is that it was ordered by the Irish government, or the provisional Irish government. Again, this is not the case. The last thing that the provisional Irish government wanted was um, uh, to 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 bring the ire to provoke the ire of the British government at a time uh, when uh, they had just been given a mandate to government, which leaves only one plausible source of uh, the assassination, and that is the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which was a secret organisation which was still extant in 1922, despite the fact that <coughs> many people felt that there was no reason for it anymore. Um, the two men most responsible for the IRB are Sam Maguire, who you may know of, um, uh, who was the head of the IRB in London, and the president of the Irish Re Re Republican Brotherhood, who is Michael Collins. Now, one of the questions I asked in the book is, why would Michael Collins, who had signed the treaty, want Henry Wilson dead? Well. Let me count the ways as, this, as, as the poem goes. First of all, Henry Wilson was held responsible for the um, pogroms which were happening in the north. The northern government of um, uh, James Craig had taken over in June of May 1921 and they were using the full force of the uh, Ulster Special Constabulary, particularly the B Specials. Uh, the RIC and the British, uh, Br the British Army against uh, Catholic civilians in the north. Uh, uh, Henry Wilson was at that time the advisor to the um, uh, Northern Government and was therefore held responsible for um, those excesses. As I point out in the book, uh, he actually uh, was not responsible for those excesses, although his public rhetoric at the time would give the impression that he was. There are also other reasons, one of which was that Michael Collins blamed uh, Henry Wilson for an incident in May and June 1922 when the British Army shelled um, uh, 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 pro and anti-treaty forces which had taken over the British part of Belik and uh, Pettigo, which are villages along the border. And thirdly, um, Henry Wilson was making bellicose noises about the British government going back into the south of Ireland to restore order. And the, the fourth reason is that um, uh, Michael Collins described uh, Wilson as a violent orange partisan who wanted to restore the uh, Protestant ascendancy in Ireland. So um, those are the reasons why Michael Collins wanted uh, Henry Wilson dead. Um, you'll have to read my book as to find out wh what happened after that. Um, but I wanted to talk, I guess, because I'm in the Midlands here and 
your neighbouring county, uh, Longford. Uh, I wanted to talk about Michael Collins's, or sorry, about Henry Wilson's uh, association with Longford. And Henry Wilson was from Longford. He was uh, he was from Curry Grand House in uh, County Longford, uh, uh, which is here, a big one of the big houses, uh, which was a twenty four room mansion. By the time that this photograph was taken in around 1915, uh, but it wasn't one of the biggest houses. Uh, it wasn't one of the huge houses. It was, it was landed gentry, but minor gentry rather than major gentry. Nevertheless, it was a, a very large house. And Henry Wilson was a Southern Unionist and vehemently po opposed to Irish national uh, nationalist opinion in a way that. Um, even Carson and Craig weren't because Carson and Craig were very much um, uh, 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 obsessed with holding on to that part of Ireland that didn't want to be part of the Home Rule Settlement or of Independence, which is of course the six counties of Ulster. But Henry Wilson was opposed to um, any form of, of independence for Ireland because it would have left his his tribe, so to speak, stranded in a, in, in, in a nationalist majority place. So Henry Wilson was educated at home and then at Marlborough College. He was, for want of better word, an institutionalised imperialist from the early age, his tireless life spent in the service of the British uh, Empire. His, identif his identity reflect reflected all those influences. I'm an Irishman born in County Longford and can say for about 50 years before Mr. Beryl came into power in 1906, the front door of my home was never shut by day or night, he declared in a speech at Caxton Hall in L London in May 1922. And his reference was to Augustine Beryl, who was the liberalising um, uh, Home Secretary for Ireland between 1906 and 1916, who was uh, somebody who... Uh, was regarded as, as quite sympathetic to the cause of Irish Home Rule. So what Wilson is saying here, basically, everything was fine and dandy until the Irish rose up and wanted Home Rule. Uh, he, that was his mentality. He believed the British government didn't understand the Irish question at all. The truth is that they understood it much better than he did. Uh, Wilson did not believe that the Irish had the means to govern themselves. And when we look back at 100 years of Irish statehood this year, we can safely say that he was wrong about that. And his family were implacably opposed to Irish nationalism and his brother Jamie stood twice unsuccessfully as a unionist, but they were not an unpopular family local and I, locally and I think that needs to be emphasised. Although their politics were at odds with those of their neighbours, the Wilsons were not unpopular landlords. Sean McKeown, who you may be aware of, the, uh, the I was going to say the butcher of Ballinley, the, the, yes, the, uh, the, the blacksmith of Ballinley had himself threatened to bury, burn Curry Green House to the ground during the War of Independence in 1921 if reprisals by Crown forces against local people did not stop. He told Jemmy to tell his brother to call it off. Jemmy protested that he had no such influence. Well, McKeown replied, in that case, it'd be too bad for Curry Grain House and for you. I added that should he attempt to leave Curry Grain, I would have him executed before he reached Edristown or Longford. The reprisals did stop, and Jamie reciprocated the gesture when McKeown was sentenced to death by the British after being captured in March 1921, urging his brother to intervene and reprieve him. As it happens, McKeown was saved by the truce that ended the War of Independence in Ju July 1921, and Curry Grand House was also saved, albeit temporarily. It was burned to the ground by anti-treaty IRA in an act of tribal spite on the 16th of August 1922, less than two months after Henry Wilson was assassinated and six days after uh, Don and O'Sullivan uh, were uh, hanged. It was, it, it was uh, an act done most likely by the anti-treaty IRA that had been blamed erroneously as it turned out by the British government for the killing. Now, McKeown had a grudging respect for Jamie, uh, James Wilson, who was Henry's brother, who he described a great courage and cleave to his unionist convictions with sincerity. Writing in the 1960s in the Evening Herald, McKeown recalled that Henry Wilson's youngest brother, Arthur, set up a home industry with his wife, Alice, for girls in the district to earn money doing crochet and lace work. The Wilsons made no monetary gain from the enterprise, but their activity enabled many girls, Catholic, Presbyterian and Protestant, to marry and save good dowries to settle them in life. They, 
This is uh, the Wilsons were a fine family and were popular in the country and in Ballinalee. Uh, and he regretted not being in a position to save Curry Grain House from being destroyed by fire. So the burning of Curry Grain House and so many other of the big houses, and I think Turns Dooley's coming to speak to you soon on this issue, uh, was just uh, just because the owners were perceived to be loyalists were. Uh, acts of tribal spite which impoverished the population in general. It was the hard-pressed taxpayers of Longford who eventually ended up having to foot the bill for Curry Grand House which cost €720,000 in t today's money. Uh, J Jamie uh, Wilson decided not to rebuild Curry Grand House because he said there was quote unquote no fashionable crowd in Curry Grand House like in the adjoining counties of Meath and Kildare and no attraction for fashionable dwellers there. Instead he agreed to build eight houses um, in Castle Park Road in Dockey County Dublin, one of the most fashionable seaside suburbs of Dublin. Uh, the money had to be paid for as I said by hard press Longford ratepayers and the council Quote, county council protested um, uh, uh, that it would, the money would leave the county and bring no benefit. So when we look back on the story of Henry Wilson, there's much to regret. The catastrophic impact uh, it had on Ireland left many people dead, not least the three principal protagonists in our story, Don O'Sullivan and Wilson. It can be said uh, that they all died for Ireland. Now, I'm just going to bring the story up to date and talk to you about some of the commemorations uh, surrounding the centenary of the death of Henry Wilson. And I was in the House of Commons on the 22nd of June, 1922, uh, 2022, for the unveiling of this plaque. You all see it? This is a plaque in the House of Commons to uh, Wilson. Um, every MP who uh, dies violently um, either in battle, as a lot of them did in the First and Second World War, or assassinations. Uh, nine have been killed violently since uh, 1806 by Irish Republicans. They get a plaque along the side of the House of Commons. But for some reason, uh, none had been provided for Wilson. So that was remedied by, um, as you can see here, Ian Paisley Jr. Um, uh, he lobbied the Speaker of the House of Commons, who's Lindsay Hoyle. You see him here. And uh, you all know who this fellow is. Yeah, he was the leader of the House of Commons at the time. So you can see uh, there was quite a, 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 a large gathering there. It also included Geoffrey Donaldson, um, Clara Lockhart, Stephen Farry, who is the MP for um, uh, North Down, the constituency that Henry Wilson was an MP in. And um, uh, various uh, different other um, uh, 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 MPs. So that is actually the chamber of the House of Commons. That's this is that's jacket here. That's literally where um, the Prime Minister sits. So as you can imagine, it's quite a, a, an auspicious place. And you might be wondering where the um, now this is where the plaque is. It's right behind the Speaker's chair. You see it there. Now, I saw this picture because these people, you know, these are these oil, stop oil now. If they are Henry Wilson, we would certainly have these people are horse whipped if he was still alive. <laughs> but that's the plaque there. You see the other ones along the wall here? Yeah. And this side as well? See how prominently located it is now. So it's right behind the speaker's chair. So if you're ever, um, you're ever looking at Prime Minister's question time, you say, oh yeah, that's that. So anyway, um, so uh, also uh, in Curry Grand, on the 22nd uh, uh, in August, I unveil this plaque, which is on the wall of the, the, the estate uh, to Henry Wilson. It states basically that this was Henry Wilson's childhood home and also the home of Jemmy, uh, his brother. And um, the, the Curry Grand House um, uh, is now owned by the Brady family, the estate in which it's built is a beautiful place. They have a fishing lodge and they have, um, they have a, 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 a beautiful lake, secluded lake. And the guy you see on the, on the right is, um, this, this chap here, is uh, a Henry Wilson's close and surviving relative. He's a guy called uh, uh, Robert Wilson Wright. Uh, he's from Kildare, but I think he's related to the Westmeath. 
uh, Wilsons who uh, include the famous astronomer and the guy who invented the automatic gearbox and the tank. And when I when I met Robert uh, 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 Wright. I had to do a double take because he's the bloody spitting image of Henry Wilson, you know. And uh, um, it was it was great to see him. So so that's it. And there was also um, there was also uh, uh, memorials to um, uh, Donan O'Sullivan. They are buried in uh, uh, Green uh, uh, Dean's Green Cemetery. Their their bodies were moved here there in 1967, having been hanged. And you can see here that there's some members of the family um, and members of the National Graves Association who have uh, 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 laid, laid, laid flowers on their grave on the 10th of August. And also there was uh, an event in uh, at Wandsworth Prison uh, by the Terence uh, McSweeney Trust, uh, which included relatives of Joe O'Sullivan. So you can see, and it's rightly so, that... Uh, that the, 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 the three pr protagonists in this 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 story is um, are, are all remembered. So, in conclusion, I would leave you with two suggestions. It I would say that it was fortunate that the civil war occurred when it did, for the sake of the provisional government. It was able to strike when the anti-treaty side was disorganised. Had the civil war not happened when it happened, it would have allowed the anti-treaty side time to organise. The second suggestion, which is uh, a contentious, I admit, is that the civil war may have been the war that the new Irish state had to have. Had it not happened, the state would have faced repeated challenges to its legitimacy. Those challenges uh, did remain, but the emphatic victory of the free state meant the prospect of a military coup d'etat would never again ex exist. The state faced military challenges, most notably during the Troubles, but never in the same way again. After the Civil War, the Irish states, Free State slowly became a normal state where the rule of law and the will of the people prevailed. For that, a hundred years on, we should be grateful. Thank you very much.